Chapter 7 of Benito Sereno. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Benito Sereno by Herman Melville. The Boat Arrives. All this is very queer now, thought Captain Delano, with a qualmish sort of emotion. But as one feeling incipient seasickness, he strove, by ignoring the symptoms, to get rid of the malady. Once more he looked off for his boat. To his delight, it was now again in view, leaving the rocky spur astern. The sensation here experienced, after at first relieving his uneasiness with unforeseen efficiency, soon began to remove it. The less distant sight of that well-known boat, showing it, not as before, half blended with the haze, but with outline defined, so that its individuality, like a man's, was manifest. That boat, Rover by name, which, though now in strange seas, had often pressed the beach of Captain Delano's home, and, brought to its threshold for repairs, had familiarly lain there, as a Newfoundland dog. The sight of that household boat evoked a thousand trustful associations which, contrasted with previous suspicions, filled him not only with lightsome confidence, but somehow with half-humorous self-reproaches at his former lack of it. What I, Amasa Delano, Jack of the Beach, as they called me when a lad, I, Amasa, the same that duck satchel in hand used to paddle along the waterside to the schoolhouse made from the old hulk i little jack of the beach that used to go burying with cousin nat and the rest i to be murdered here at the ends of the earth on board a haunted pirate ship by a horrible spaniard too nonsensical to think of who would murder amasa delano his conscience is clean there is someone above fie fie jack of the beach you are a child indeed, a child of the second childhood, old boy. You are beginning to dote and drool, I'm afraid. Light of heart and foot, he stepped aft, and there was met by Don Benito's servant, who, with a pleasing expression, responsive to his own present feelings, informed him that his master had recovered from the effects of his coughing fit, and had just ordered him to go present his compliments to his good guest, Don Amasa, and say that he, Don Benito, would soon have the happiness to rejoin him. There, now, do you mark that? Again, thought Captain Delano, walking the poop. What a donkey I was! This kind gentleman who here sends me his kind compliments, he but ten minutes ago, dark lantern in hand, was dodging round some old grindstone in the hold, sharpening a hatchet for me, I thought. Well, well, these long calms have a morbid effect on the mind, I've often heard, though I never believed it before. Huh, glancing toward the boat. There's Rover, a good dog, a white bone in her mouth. A pretty big bone, though, seems to me. What? Yes, she has fallen afoul of the bubbling tide rip there. It sets her the other way, too, for the time. Patience. It was now about noon, though, from the grayness of everything, it seemed to be getting toward dusk. The calm was confirmed. In the far distance, away from the influence of land, the leaden ocean seemed laid out and let it up, its course finished, soul gone, defunct. But the current from landward, where the ship was, increased silently sweeping her further and further toward the tranced waters beyond. Still, from his knowledge of those latitudes, cherishing hopes of a breeze and a fair and fresh one at any moment, Captain Delano, despite present prospects, buoyantly counted upon bringing the San Dominic safely to anchor ere night. The distance swept over was nothing, since, with a good wind, ten minutes sailing, would retrace more than sixty minutes drifting. Meantime, one moment turning to Mark Rover fighting the tide-rip, 
and the next to see Don Benito approaching. He continued walking the poop. Gradually he felt a vexation arising from the delay of his boat. This soon merged into uneasiness, and at last his eye falling continually, as from a stage-box into the pit, upon the strange crowd before and below him, and by and by recognizing there the face, now composed to indifference, of the Spanish sailor who had seemed to beckon from the main chains, something of his old trepidations returned. Ah, thought he, gravely enough this is like the ague. Because it went off, it follows not that it won't come back. Though ashamed of the relapse, he could not altogether subdue it. And so, exerting his good nature to the utmost, insensibly he came to a compromise. Yes, this is a strange craft, a strange history, too, and strange folks on board. But nothing more. By way of keeping his mind out of mischief till the boat should arrive, he tried to occupy it with turning over and over, in a purely speculative sort of way, some lesser peculiarities of the captain and crew. Among others, four curious points recurred. First, the affair of the Spanish lad assailed with a knife by the slave boy, an act winked at by Don Benito. Second, the tyranny in Don Benito's treatment of Atufal, the black, as if a child should lead a bull of the Nile by the ring in his nose. Third, the trampling of the sailor by the two negroes, a piece of insolence passed over without so much as a reprimand. Fourth, the cringing submission to their master of all the ship's underlings, mostly blacks, as if by the least inadvertence they fear to draw down his despotic displeasure. Coupling these points, they seem somewhat contradictory. But what then, thought Captain Delano, glancing toward his now nearing boat, what then? Why, this Don Benito is a very capricious commander. But he is not the first of the sort I have seen, though it's true he rather exceeds any other. But as a nation, continued he in his reveries, these Spaniards are all an odd set. The very word Spaniard has a curious, conspirator, guy fawkish twang to it. And yet, I dare say, Spaniards in the main are as good folks as any in Dukesbury, Massachusetts. Ah, good. At last, Rover has come. As, with its welcome freight, the boat touched the side, the oakum pickers, with venerable gestures, sought to restrain the blacks, who, at the sight of three gurried water-casks in its bottom, and a pile of wilted pumpkins in its bow, hung over the bulwarks in disorderly raptures. Don Benito, with his servant, now appeared, his coming, perhaps, hastened by hearing the noise. Of him, Captain Delano sought permission to serve out the water, so that all might share alike and none injure themselves by unfair excess. But sensible, and, on Don Benito's account, kind as this offer was, it was received with what seemed impatience, as if aware that he lacked energy as a commander, Don Benito, with the true jealousy of weakness, resented as an affront any interference. So at least Captain Delano inferred. In another moment the casks were being hoisted in, when some of the eager negroes accidentally jostled Captain Delano where he stood by the gangway, so that, unmindful of Don Benito, yielding to the impulse of the moment with good-natured authority, he bade the blacks stand back. To enforce his words, making use of a half-mirthful, half-menacing gesture. Instantly the blacks paused, just where they were, each negro and negress suspended in his or her posture, exactly as the word had found them, for a few seconds continuing so, while, as between the responsive posts of a telegraph, an unknown syllable ran from man to man among the perched oakum pickers. While Captain Delano's attention was fixed by this scene, suddenly the hatchet polishers half rose, and a rapid cry came from Don Benito. Thinking that at the signal of the Spaniard he was about to be massacred, Captain Delano would have sprung for his boat, but paused, 
as the oakum pickers, dropping down into the crowd with earnest exclamations, forced every white and every negro back, at the same moment, with gestures friendly and familiar, almost jocose, bidding him in substance not be a fool. Simultaneously, the hatchet polishers resumed their seats, quietly as so many tailors, and at once, as if nothing had happened, the work of hoisting in the casks was resumed, whites and blacks singing at the tackle. Captain Delano glanced toward Don Benito. As he saw his meager form in the act of recovering itself from reclining in the servant's arms into which the agitated invalid had fallen, he could not but marvel at the panic by which himself had been surprised on the darting supposition that such a commander, who, upon a legitimate occasion, so trivial too, as it now appeared, could lose all self-command, was, with energetic iniquity, going to bring about his murder. The casks being on deck, Captain Delano was handed a number of jars and cups by one of the steward's aides, who, in the name of Don Benito, entreated him to do as he had proposed, dole out the water. He complied with republican impartiality as to this republican element, which always seeks one level, serving the oldest white no better than the youngest black, excepting, indeed, poor Don Benito, whose condition, if not rank, demanded an extra allowance. To him, in the first place, Captain Delano presented a fair pitcher of the fluid. But thirsting as he was for fresh water, Don Benito quaffed not a drop until after several grave bows and salutes, a reciprocation of courtesies which the sight-loving Africans hailed with clapping of hands. Two of the less wilted pumpkins being reserved for the cabin table, the residue were minced up on the spot for the general regalement. But the soft bread, sugar, and bottled cider, Captain Delano would have given the Spaniards alone, and in chief Don Benito, but the latter objected, which disinterestedness on his part not a little pleased the American, and so mouthfuls all around were given alike to whites and blacks, excepting one bottle of cider, which Babo insisted upon setting aside for his master. Here it may be observed that as, on the first visit of the boat, the American had not permitted his men to board the ship, neither did he now, being unwilling to add to the confusion of the decks. Not uninfluenced by the peculiar good humor at present prevailing, and for the time oblivious of any but benevolent thoughts, Captain Delano, who from recent indications counted upon a breeze within an hour or two at furthest, dispatched the boat back to the sealer with orders for all the hands that could be spared immediately to set about rafting casks to the watering place and filling them. Likewise, he bade word be carried to his chief officer that, if against present expectation the ship was not brought to anchor by sunset, he need be under no concern, for, as there was to be a full moon that night, he, Captain Delano, would remain on board, ready to play the pilot, should the wind come soon or late. As the two captains stood together, observing the departing boat, the servant, as it happened, having just spied a spot on his master's velvet sleeve, and silently engaged rubbing it out, the American expressed his regrets that the San Dominic had no boats none at least but the unseaworthy old hulk of the longboat, which, warped as a camel skeleton in the desert, and almost as bleached, lay potwise inverted amidships, one side a little tipped, furnishing a subterraneous sort of den for family groups of the blacks, mostly women and small children, who, squatting on old mats below, or perched above in the dark dome on the elevated seats, were descried, some distance within, like a social circle of bats, sheltering in some friendly cave, at intervals, ebon flights of naked boys and girls, three or four years old, darting in and out of the den's mouth. "'Had you three or four boats now, Don Benito,' said Captain Delano, "'I think that, by tugging at the oars, your negroes here might help along matters some. Did you sail from port without boats, Don Benito?' "'They were stove in the gales, senor.' That was bad. Many men, too, you lost then. Boats and men. 
Those must have been hard gales, Don Benito. Past all speech, cringed the Spaniard. Tell me, Don Benito, continued his companion with increased interest, tell me, were these gales immediately off the pitch of Cape Horn? Cape Horn? Who spoke of Cape Horn? Yourself did, when giving me an account of your voyage, answered Captain Delano, with almost equal astonishment at this eating of his own words, even as he ever seemed eating his own heart on the part of the Spaniard. You yourself, Don Benito, spoke of Cape Horn, he emphatically repeated. The Spaniard turned, in a sort of stooping posture, pausing an instant, as one about to make a plunging exchange of elements, as from air to water. End of chapter 7 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista